Beloved, I want to welcome you to this session of Going Deeper. I am with Dr. Chris Green, and we are going to be talking about the Mount of Transfiguration and what takes place there and how that ties into our journey in Christ. And so I want you to just listen in, lean in, and allow the Holy Spirit to open up your heart and mind to what it is that we need to live into in Christ in relation to that story. Dr. Chris, um, in the Lenten season, one of the readings this year is, um, is tied to the transfiguration in Mark's account, Mark 9, yeah. um, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. Give us the backstory and take us into that story. Yeah, I, I think there is this, and if you've been in our churches for very long at all, you've heard the sermon about what happens at the top of the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain. You know, the, the disciples are at the top of the mountain. They come down, and at the bottom of the mountain, there's this demon, demonized boy who cannot be, cannot be healed, cannot be delivered. And I think that there's something about that pattern of light and darkness, height and depth, speech and silence that this story is drawing together. And in the Christian year, which begins with Advent as we're waiting for Christmas, waiting for Christ to come, and then moves from Christmas to Epiphany, where he's revealed at his baptism to be the beloved, and then at his transfiguration, again, to be, to be the, the beloved. beloved. Mm -hmm. In those moments of Epiphany, what's striking is that what immediately follows, the baptism is Jesus' own temptation in the wilderness. What follows the transfiguration is the cross. So that these moments of epiphany are followed by seasons of suffering and darkness and silence. And that pattern of glorious revelation followed by heavy, difficult challenge, I think it is meant to teach us something about the way the Christian life the pattern that the shows up in God. Our, the ways Teach of God. Me your in ways that I might walk in your pants. Absolutely, and and I think tragically, some of us have have been given a form of Christianity in which we go from mountaintop to mountaintop, right? In which we go from glorious experience to glorious experience, miracle to miracle, but that's inhuman and it's untrue to the ways of God. It's untrue to the ways of God, which are spelled out so clearly in the life of Jesus in Scripture. So when when we think about um, the, the transfiguration story. You've got Jesus choosing Peter, James, and John. Come on, boys. We've got to go somewhere. And the other nine, guys, I need you to stay here and um, we'll be back. Right. Now, there's all sorts of ways we can read that. Yeah. And so here we go up at the top of the mountain. Talk about what's happening at the top of the mountain. So at the top of the mountain, Jesus, we're told, is transfigured before them, which in our kind of Sunday school version of that, it just means he glowed a little, <laughs> right? But, but there's a lot more going on than, yeah, you know, shiny skin, right? right? I mean, it's not, it's not as if he, he, you know, had some kind of glow like a pregnant woman, you know, in this moment. What's actually happening there is a revelation of, of his identity as God. And so Thomas Aquinas, who's a medieval theologian from Italy, he, he says what's happening in that moment is that the soul of Jesus floods into his body and overflows his body into the world. And in a moment, in that, in that moment, there is clarity about who he is. The disciples see him as he is. They see him for who he is. And the transfiguration is, it's a theophany. It's a revelation of, of who God is, right? And they're, they're not seeing light. They're seeing that which light represents. They're seeing the light of God's own life, not created light, but uncreated light. They're, they're seeing the light that scripture refers to when it says, you know, he is the light of the world. Right, not not the light that creates photosynthesis, right? But the light that is the divine essence. The That's prime, what they're the seeing. The primal, uncreated light. The uncreated light. And what's astonishing, though, is that they see it, and the response is fear. So, so in Mark, there's this parallel between three men at the top of the mountain and three women in the tomb or at the tomb at the end of the gospel. 
This, this is scandalous, but go back and read the text, right? So on the mountain, Jesus is transfigured before them. They see the uncreated light and Peter, James, and John are terrified and only Peter speaks up. And I think Peter speaks up for the same reason that Moses puts on the veil. He's trying to protect the others. He, he's trying to control the situation for their sake, right? And I think almost always when, we're, when we understand ourselves as leaders, as pastors, as teachers, our, our greatest failures are failures born from our instinct to protect others from the fullness of God. Oh my, say that again. That is profound. I, I think our failures, and I, the Moses in the veil story I think is about this, that the fullness of God is terrifying because it opens the fullness of up, us up. Right? When we see God in his fullness, it answers, the deep in us answers to that. And it's terrifying. And those of us who feel like leaders, our instincts are to protect those people, even especially from God. Rescue them from God. And in the name of pastoral care, <laughs> we're actually interrupting, interrupting something that is essential. the holy work of the Spirit right. to shape them into Christ. And I think this is what Peter is doing. So what happens is he says, let us build three tabernacles. And Mark tells us he said this because they were afraid. I think that, that wording is very important. He said this because they, they were they. afraid. Peter senses their fear and thinks, oh, I know how to solve this. Right? But of course, he knows no idea what he's talking about. Right? And, and in many ways, this is a worse failure than the failure of rebuking, rebuking Jesus. Jesus. Right? Because this is, this is a failure of interfering at the moment of God's full self-revelation, right? He, he, and he's not rebuked for it, but what happens is a cloud descends. And this, I think, is so important when we're thinking about the pattern, the ways of God with us, is that he shows the light, their response is terror, and a cloud settles over them. The cloud, the cloud that was in the wilderness, right? The cloud that led them. The darkness covers them, and a voice says, listen, if you can't keep yourself from talking when you see the fullness, listen to him, right? A very similar thing happens at the end of the gospel. So you've got three women now, two Marys and Salome, who are at the empty tomb. They see the empty tomb, and the angel says to them, he's risen. Go and tell Peter and the other disciples that he will meet them and you in Galilee. And Mark 16, 8 says, and they fled from the tomb afraid and said nothing to anyone. <laughs> and what are we to do with that, right? It, it's the same experience now. Like on the mountaintop, they see the fullness of his glory. They're terrified. And they're terrified. In the, in the garden, they see the absence his new presence leaves and they're terrified. It doesn't, they have no category for this. They don't know what's happening. They're, they're right. overwhelmed by it. And this... We, we like to think, when we tell the story, we tell the story of resurrection as some kind of happy reconciliation. But if you read the ends of the gospel, the end of the gospels, people are terrified. They have no idea what to make of it. And they doubt, right? At the end of Matthew's gospel. Absolutely, Matthew 28. Some doubted while he's, while he's ascending. There's the resurrected Jesus <laughs> ascending, declaring to them what we call the Great Commission, and they're doubting it because it's too much for them. They don't, they don't have categories for this, right? They, they have no way of making sense of what's happened. And I think that's what I mean when I say the fullness of God is what terrifies us the most. When you were introducing uh, th these conversations, you said something about the ways in which God comes to us in our trouble. But sometimes the God who comes to us in our is, trouble is, is, the, trouble, troubling is one. the troubling one. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's troubling us toward holiness. Yeah. So there's the yeah, trouble yeah, yeah. God saves us from, and then there's the trouble God can't save us from. And the trouble God can't save us from is the trouble of us becoming true. There's no, sh God doesn't take shortcuts. He doesn't lie. And that means he can never call us what we are not. He calls us holy, not by lying about us, but by calling that into existence, right? He's summoning that out of us. So when he says to us, we are the righteousness of God, he's not saying, well, I know you're really unrighteous, but I'm gonna say you are anyway. It's, I know you're really unrighteous, and I'm going to speak a creative word to you. Let there be light. But it takes time for that Absolutely. light to spread, right? And I think that's one of the ways we've missed the mark, no pun intended. I mean, we've missed the mark of, of, in, in talking about how sanctification happens and the need for the darkness. And I think 
when you have a mountaintop to mountaintop, miracle to miracle kind of spirituality, you have no sense of the need for the valley to make sense of what's happened to you on the mountaintop. But the reason the cloud descends is not because it's at odds with the light. It's they've got to have time to absorb it. Listen now. Right? I've shown you what you need to see. And at the end of his life, Peter will say, this is the sure word. Right. We were We beheld his majesty on the mountain. Right. We saw this. Right. John will say the same thing. We handled right. the word of life. But they don't, they're not ready to say that on that mountain. Right. They're not. They need the valley to process it. And I think this is what makes humans human. We process things. Right? It doesn't happen automatically. We have an experience. It takes time for that. We have to digest it. Right? And that, again, I think is part of what we learn at the Eucharist, right? Eat this, and you've got to digest Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right? And, and it's got to be assimilated. That, that is, unfortunately, I think now largely missing from the way that we teach. And I think the season of Lent is a digestive season. It, it, it's, in some circles, the focus is on mortality, right? That Lent is about facing your death. You know, Ash Wednesday, dust you are, dust you shall return. But that's not really what we're saying. Lent is not primarily about mortality. It's primarily about creatureliness. And that includes mortality, but it's not only about that. It's reminding you, you're created. And you're created to be a particular kind of creature. Mm -hmm. One with time and space, a, an embodied creature. A creature with ears and a mouth and eyes. Right? A creature who doesn't hear everything at once and doesn't say everything at once and doesn't say everything to everyone at once. And, and that, that kind of coming to our, be, becoming comfortable in our own skin, that's another way of talking about what I think sanctification is, what, what the season of Lent is about. How could you be comfortable if you're at the top of a mountain <laughs> and two dead prophets right, show up in bodily form <laughs> yeah around the rabbi that's been teaching. I mean, I mean, and talk about it's Moses and Elijah. Yeah. I know all the sermons, but just yeah. give us an angle on uh, it. I think this is so beautiful. One is remember what happens to Moses and Elijah. Yeah, they both fail. They both fail at the end of their lives. Right. And fail dramatically. And Moses is told what? You cannot you enter can't the, go promise into the promise land. But where is he? He's in the promise land. In the transfiguration. Right. Christ has brought him in right. to the promise that he did not see in his own lifetime. And Elijah has failed because he didn't anoint the king as he was supposed to anoint. So What's he doing in this moment? He's, he's, anointing, he's anointing the king, king for his he's departure. He's fulfilling right. his mission, that Christ is making possible the salvation of those who in their own lifetimes could not fulfill so it. So past, present, and future is our dilemma, not God's. Absolutely. Because, just to get more mind-blowing, when Moses goes up the mountain, before his failure, when Moses goes up the mountain and sees the back of God, well, who in God has a back? Only the Son. Jesus. Who in God has a hand to write? Only the Son. So G Moses is seeing the same Jesus in his lifetime that, Mo that he is seeing in this Mount of Transfiguration. It's the same one. And, and Jesus says this outright. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Right? That Jesus, and, and this is what the, the church fathers say about, you know, when the fourth man in the fire. Absolutely. Who is that? It's Jesus, right? That he, he is not bound. He's the, and, and scripture says it outright. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? The, the Jesus Christ that they see on the Mount of Transfiguration is the Jesus Christ who wrote the Ten Commandments, is the Jesus Christ who passed by Moses, is the Jesus Christ who showed up in the fire with the three Hebrew children. And that's what they come to understand later in their life, right? They, they have to have time to digest that, right? I mean, that doesn't come to them all at once, of course. And, but that, that's why their lives are, they never recover from it, right? Can, can and you they're imagine? not supposed to and recover. And they're not supposed to recover, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> they get undone. They, that, they get undone. That's right. I mean, that, isn't that what it means to be full of the Spirit? It's to be blown away. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're blown away by the realization of, we thought we knew who this was. And we had no idea. Concomitantly, with that going on up here, down here, you've got a father who has never bonded with a son. Right. 
and we're told that this little boy has been thrown into the fire and into the water. Now, I find those oh, two opposites. Absolutely. Uh, those are those are semiotic for me. Those are yep. signs of something. But this little boy is thrown to extremes, or or adolescent boy. We don't know. Him. So there's never been a moment of rest in That's that right. family system. That's right. It's a, in part what's going on with the fire and water is a perversion of Jesus who baptizes us. Ah. Uh, right. And, and so the, the, it's, a, it's a reversal, uh, a, a, an evil perversion or parody of, of that in part. So, so, and so, so hence we're back to the demonic now. Yeah, okay. Yep, absolutely. So he is thrown to these extremes, thrown. Yes. Um, and his father can do nothing about it. And his it. father can't do anything about it, but neither can the nine. Right. They can't, for whatever reason, I, I have my suspicions, but they can't. Jesus comes down. Now, we, we, now we're leaving out the conversation. Let, let's, before we go there, the conversation on the way down the mountain is really important. It, it is because it reveals something about how Jesus is experiencing all of this differently than they do. Right. So they're coming down from the mountain and, they, and it says, again, they're afraid to say anything. But, I mean, they're terrified. And Jesus isn't explaining. All he, in Mark's gospel, all he says is, don't tell anyone about what you've seen. <laughs> Right, so not only have, have they had this experience, now they're and told, they're not allowed to talk don't about talk it. about it. <laughs> and so they're, they're thinking, obviously reeling from what's happened. And so they finally come up with a question they can ask. And that is, hey, I, I thought we had been taught that before the coming of the Lord, Elijah would reappear. And then Jesus says this incredibly cryptic thing. He says, well, if you can hear it, he already has come in John the Baptist. Now, remember, they just saw Elijah on, on the mount. And they're thinking, wait a minute, was that the end of the history? Is that what that meant? And he says, no, you don't understand. This was already fulfilled, if you can hear it. But he, he's, he's testing whether or not they're able to hear it. And then they get to the valley and encounter these nine who are in despair because they can't, they can't do what they want to do and, and feel they need to do. And Jesus isn't all that happy with what's going on at the bottom of the mountain. I think in some ways this is the most painful moment in Jesus' life. I, it's one of the most painful moments in his life. I think it's, it's similar to what happens at the tomb of Lazarus and obviously is anticipating what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think in a lot of ways this is far worse than anything that happened in the wilderness for him. Because in the wilderness it's him and Satan. I, I mean, and he feels the pain of that. But here the grief is you're faithless. And I don't think it's the impatience of someone who's really good at something being irritated that other people aren't as good as he is at it. I don't think this is ego, and I don't think this is driven by Jesus just wishing they would get it already. Right. I think it's pain at realizing how horrible it is for them that this is how they experience life. That he realizes in this moment, you know so little about yourselves and about God that you live in this place, that you live with this kind of unawareness. And I, I think it, it's a, deep, a point of deep grief for him, and he doesn't know if he can bear it. I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's intercessory, well, the pain it's, he Well, it's feels. evident by what he says. That's right. I think I that's mean, right. You know, go there. Yeah, I mean, it's a, he, he's, and it's why I think he rushes to, I'm, I'm ready to do my work. Like, he's, he wants to deliver them from from this despair they're in and don't even know that they're in. And I think, that's, I think that's at least part of why he weeps at the tomb of Lazarus. Obviously, not because Lazarus has died, although you know we hear that in a lot of sermons. I think he's weeping because look at how these people have to experience death, right? That, that kind of awareness of seeing the pain of their experience and knowing things about them they don't know about themselves and what comes out of him is intercession. You know? And I, I think... That's what should be moving us, right? I mean, that kind of, the deep groaning of the spirit. I think that's what's happening to Jesus. Why could we not cast him out? Yeah. So what's going on in their nine minds as to yeah. their failure? What's... Yeah, I what think are the mind games that are. Being I think played? they're panicked. I think they're panicked. In, I, and I, I, you know, I've heard you talk about this before, and I think it's right. 
I think the fact that Jesus took three disciples up the mountain and left the nine of them, yeah. I think there's uncertainty already. Are we the problem? Yeah. Right? Are we the second class disciples? Right. That don't and have are we what now, it takes to go up. Exactly. Are we now exposed as not really having everything we need? So, so I think is this simply that. revealing our incompetence? I think that's... I think so that's so they don't have the capability of thinking, we've been left here for a purpose. And Absolutely. we've been taught, well, we, we can do this. They, it's not there. Absolutely. It's not there. Um, but now when they, when, they, when they do ask that of Jesus, you know, after, you know, he says, bring, you know, oh, yeah. faithless generation, how long shall I put up with you? Yes. Bring him to me. Um, and again, I think that's the voice of the pain. It is. You know? It is. And, and I don't think we've explored that sufficiently. And, right. you know, we, we preach for effect sometimes. I, I get it. Look, all of us love the preaching moment. We preach for effect. We want to make a point. We want to drive it home. But we may be premature in what we're driving home um, and failing to look at this is God in the flesh groaning for his creatures. Absolutely and yearning for them to see what they can't see. And can I, can I just interrupt to say this? This is where we get it wrong. We think he's offended that they don't have enough faith in him. That's not it. He's offended, he's troubled, that they don't have enough faith in themselves and in God's work in them. He's troubled not because he has an ego need. He's, he's not, you know, it's not that God needs us to have faith because he gets affirmation from us right, believing in right. him. He calls us to have faith because we need faith to live the lives we're called to live. We, we can't be ourselves if we aren't living with that confidence in God. So again, he's grieving here not because his ego is wounded. He's grieving because their humanity is lacking. So, so and he knows he's got to do something about that. He's got to fix it. At yeah. the same time, there's also something he knows could have happened. Yes. Would that be a fair? Absolutely. Okay. So in knowing and, it could have, should have happened. Uh, okay. Should so, have happened. so in knowing, so, so my, my tendencies are always to look at this theologically and then let's look at it psychologically. The, mm. the, the psyche, the human psyche, um, Jesus came to make us human. Yeah. And fully human to be spiritual is to be human, to be more human. Um, where is their humanity lacking in relation? Because because they turn this into a, almost a three ring circus, and it gets oh, pretty intense. It does, yeah. Well, I think it's about ego for them. I think it's about the way they understand themselves. One is they're trying to prove themselves. They're trying to prove trying themselves to validate themselves. to themselves right. and the crowd. Right. They're not really concerned about that man and his son. Right. They're more concerned. You know their appearance. And this is what I think for all of us who are in ministry. I think all of us who come to ministry come to ministry because we want to be ministers, not because we want to do ministry, not because we want to care for people. That's profound. We want to be seen as people who care for people. And I think that's what, exactly what's going on with them. They want to be seen as the people who can do whatever needs to be done. And they can't. And they're now exposed. And I, I think that's part of Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to teach the nine. So Jesus doesn't experience all of this like they do. He's not selecting the three for, as his favorites to give them something special. Right. The nine need to learn this lesson for the three's sake. And the three need to learn this lesson for the nine's sake. Right. And the 12 need to learn it for the sake of the for world. For the sake of the world. And, and for our sake. So as we close, because I'm, I'm going to throw, throw a monkey wrench in here. <laughs> the three that go up, one of them's going to live the longest yeah. of the entire 12 One's going to be the first martyr of the church, yeah. and the other one's going to complain that you know he gets a bad prophecy from Jesus at the end of his <laughs> life, and his buddy, who's going to live a long time, yeah. well, what about him? Does he? Well, well, he, if he stays till I come, what does it mean to you? Just yeah. put put all that together in the last minute. Yeah, I, I, th I think that the, the church fathers talk about how symbolic it is that it's Peter, James, and John who go up. That these are three types of ministry in the church. John is the mystic. James is the monastic and Peter is the bishop. The bishop. He's the, he's the cleric. And that all three have to learn. There's a way of living their lives toward the cross. 
that's for the sake of the others. Yeah, yeah. But it's true to their own calling. And I, I think that's the essence of it. I think, and again, that's for the sake of the nine and the 12 for and the sake of the world. For the world. Yeah. Beloved, as we come to a close, I want you to take some time and reflect on where in your journey the Lord is troubling you. We had talked in an earlier session about agree with your adversary, that, that God is the adversary, and that that's how the church fathers looked at that passage, that God is the adversary, and that George MacDonald looked at it that way. Where, do you, where is God troubling your waters to invite you to a place of the mark of the cross so that you can become more fully human, more fully alive, more the person he intends you to be? Miroslav Volf talks about, in his book, Exclusion and Embrace, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And if I understand Miroslav correctly, that's the very center of the entire Christian message. It's all chock full of the insight of Paul's statement in Galatians 2, 20, 20, 21, 22. And he talks about the fact that we have been decentered from that center of Christ and all sorts of things can happen to us in that decentering and that the cross brings us back to a centering where Christ is alive, but so are we in a proper relationship at the core of our being. And so where are the areas in this season where you're sensing, I'm not centered in Christ the way I'm supposed to be, because I promise you those are the areas where God is wanting to bring you into an epiphany of sorts and invite you to say, from this place of being decentered, I can't cast this stuff out. I can't do it. And I've got to get back to a place of being centered in the cross. Because I think if we could sum up the entire Lenten season, that's what we're moving towards as we renew that kind of awareness at this point in our lives. So, Father, I pray for all my brothers and sisters in God TV and in the, in the family of believers all around the world. I pray that you would cause us to know where you're troubling us because we've been decentered and need to be recentered in Christ Jesus. Allow us the grace to have you put the mark of the cross on us in those areas that we might grow in that grace and in the knowledge, the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus and be filled to overflowing with your spirit and your spirit alone. We ask that, Father, in Christ's precious name. Amen. Thank you.